Boulder Odyssey Freediver has a big name to live up to. That name? Odysseus, of course. So, is this microbrand community favourite a bit of a legend or not? Welcome back to the channel. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already and hit the bell so that every time I upload, roughly every five weeks or so, you're the first to find out. So this is the Boulder Odyssey Freediver. I'm gonna give this the full review treatment. To find out in more detail how that all works, click here or here, somewhere around here. I explain it all in that review, but I'm gonna be going over the four key categories as we boldly dive into this Odyssey of a review. Okay, first up, design. One criticism you can't often level at micro brands is that they lack originality. The Odyssey Freediver is no exception. Though it has shades of other watches, notably to me the Longines Spirit purely looking at the numerals in the date window at 6 o'clock, and also the Seiko Samurai with its blocky angular K shape, it is very much its own watch. This thing very much lives up to that bolder moniker. The dial has real depth thanks to that raised chapter ring, which also has little cutouts for these kind of steampunk screws at every hour. They're weird. Not that there's anything necessarily wrong with weird. I've really got to stop reading this diary. The second hand has a nice orange baton and tip, which matches nicely with the little orange marker at 12. It's as if the watch has been graffitied by Ed Sheeran just a little bit. I could have done with the second and minute hands reaching further out to the edges of the dial, but overall, it's proportioned nicely, with a tasteful amount of text listing the model name and water resistance, and there's room for the dial to breathe. Those numerals are a slight departure from the typical dive watch indices. That makes it a bit more versatile in that this doesn't immediately necessarily strike you as a dive watch, especially in this frosted colorway, where the bezel insert is almost non-existent. If you are a diver and plan to use this diving, one, you're mental, get something else. And two, you'd be better off just writing a number on the back of your hand in permanent marker rather than trusting this. There are better tools out there, but they can be big and bulky, and this is equipped with the slim Miyota 9015 movement, so surely it's a slender watch on wrist. Well, not quite. Sadly, the dimensions stop this from being a truly versatile dive watch in the way that, say, a Submariner might be. The listed 40mm diameter is actually closer to 41mm with the bezel, and the 14mm thickness means getting it under a cuff is going to be tricky. Sized up for my 6.5 inch wrist, this weighs 180 grams. Now, if you live alone and you wear your watch on your right wrist, you might be okay, but I wear mine on my left and this arm just ain't up to it. More on that in the fit and finish section shortly. So a 6 out of 10 for the design, which is an okay start I guess. But a high beat Miyota 9015 should claw back some of those points. So how is the movement? In terms of functionality, it's a 3 hand automatic movement with a date complication. Setting the time and date on the watch is a joy thanks to this big old crown which has the sort of industrial knurling reminiscent of the factory that produced Edward Scissorhands. Winding is smooth, setting the time and date is easy, and screwing and unscrewing the crown is as easy as screwing and unscrewing your mum. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I don't even know your mum. I'm 31, for Christ's sake. Unlike the sentiment of that joke, this movement is actually very accurate. It's running at around plus four and a half seconds per day, which is within cost parameters. That's no joke. And because it's a pretty common movement, it'll be really easy and probably cost effective to get it serviced or swap it out if you need to. So a nine out of 10 for the movement. There's no watch magic bonus point as it is still just a Miyota 9015, but still a solid performance. Now everybody's favorite category, price. Brand new from Boulder's website, this watch costs 550 pounds or $649. The packaging is substantial as are the materials on offer. It's a full stainless steel watch, which has been given a matte, almost bead blasted like finish. We have a fully milled clasp with a generous six micro adjustment holes and quick release spring bars. The Miyota movement is a bit of a drawback, but it is running accurately and it's still high beat. 
If this came with a Salita SW200 or something similar, it'd take the price to well above £700. The price is just about acceptable for what you're getting, I think. As for the warranty, well, you get 30 days to change your mind if you don't like it and you can return it to Boulder if it is unworn. The warranty itself is 30 months, just covering the movements. That's good! But the 30 month thing, that doesn't include external damage like scratches and stuff, it's strictly if it's got a defective movement. That's bad. Plus, Boulder charge for a quote, shipping, handling and servicing fee of $30 which applies to all engagements of warranty services to be borne by the customer. That's bad. Can I go now? So a kind of mixed bag for the warranty. Out of principle, I'm giving it a one because that $30 fee is, frankly, a load of Ticketmaster booking fee bullshit. That doesn't fill me with confidence about the brand really, but does that affect their brand cachet? In a word, no. In two words, not really. In the micro brand space, Boulder is pretty well known mainly for their big utilitarian dive watches, field watches, but also their knives and wallets. Being known for knives and wallets isn't something I'd personally brag about, especially in front of law enforcement, but it has given Boulder a bit of an identity. It's the sort of brand your mate who's been digging an air raid shelter in his back garden for the last three months might be into. In terms of the brand's aesthetic, the logo is a good one. It's modern and it suits the design language we see elsewhere, including that kind of MI5 mini suitcase that it comes in. That packaging is also part of Boulder's aim to move towards 80% sustainable materials for their products and what they come packaged in. It's a noble and welcome aim, but I'd like to get some hard stats on just how sustainable the whole thing is. Nevertheless, it's really nice to see a brand include sustainability as part of their core values, and that really does deserve some commendation. Overall, that's a five for the price. Last up, rather aptly, finishing. Given that this has an all matte finish, save for a couple of small polished facets, at almost every angle, this looks clean and crisp. There's not really much you can say about, well, the brushing or the coarseness of the steel as such. The 120 click unidirectional bezel has a ceramic insert and a crisp, precise action. Plus, I really like the grooves along the raised ridges of the bezel. It's grippy and it's easy to turn. Have a listen. Though that is like music to my ears, unfortunately, in this frosted colourway, the indentations that serve as markers on that bezel insert end up yellowing due to dust or dirt or whatever the hell is hanging around in the air these days. Don't expect it to look pristine forever, and don't expect to be able to read those indentations in anything but bright, almost surgical light. Thankfully, even in bright light, that sapphire crystal has enough AR coating to remain legible, that could also have something to do with the colour of the dial. The texture of Rich really pops when it does catch the light right. That can't be said for the loom. It's quite patchy. It's a fully loomed bezel insert and even though those numerals are applied on the dial, neither the bezel insert nor the Arabics are full of enough BGW9 superluminova to stand the test of time. The hands fare better, but still not the sort of thing I'd be depending on 300 meters beneath the surface of the ocean. This is also a hefty watch. I did mention those 180 grams earlier. At the risk of sounding like OK Magazine, 30 grams lighter and maybe I wouldn't have ran off with the secretary, which is a watch and of a watch, a lighter watch. It needs to be lighter is what I'm saying. I tried out on a NATO strap, but that made it too thick on the wrist. And then I tried it on this amazing Tropic style strap from Watch Gecko. And although that makes it more comfortable for long stretches of time, the large spaces that would normally be occupied by the male end links are pretty unsightly and do make it clear that this watch was made for its bracelet. And it is a good bracelet in fairness. It's got screw pins and there's six micro adjustment holes on the clasp, so you'll probably get a good fit. But if you want to put this on anything other than the bracelet, it'll likely look a little bit unrefined. It's a watch that, if you've got the wrist for it, is going to be just the tool you're after, but it's by no means a strap monster. 
On the bracelet, I've had to give my left wrist a couple of breaks during any given day, which I normally only do with my right. So a five for the execution. Okay, George Dawes, what are the scores? <laughs> And the scores are these dudes. So it's a six overall for the Boulder Odyssey Free Diver. It's solid, it's built like a tank, and it runs as reliably as your nan's old Skoda. But just like her little green Fabia, it's not gonna be too comfortable on long journeys, and you'll probably have to stop for plenty of toilet breaks. By no means a bad watch, but one that could be so much better with just a couple of tweaks, like maybe a slimmer profile with reduced water resistance perhaps, or the option of a black dial, and maybe the option of a Swiss movement for a bit more dosh too. But what would you change about this watch? Something? Nothing? Anything? Let me know down in the comments. Please give the video a thumbs up if you liked it, and please subscribe if you haven't done so already. The more subscribers, the more videos I can put together. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.